I will be talking about your body, its ability to heal itself, how and why it heals itself. But before we go there, I would like to first address the most common theories on why human bodies get sick, why human bodies are not healing. And I think you'll agree with me, there is a lot of sickness on the planet today. To do that, we need to go down to the cell. You see, we are just a bunch of cells. There are approximately 100 trillion cells in the human body. We have eye cells, we have muscle cells, skin cells, bone cells, brain cells. And to understand how the human body heals itself, we need to go down to the smallest component, which is the cell. Right down in the middle of each cell is the DNA. The DNA is the genetic code. It's inside the nucleus and it's the genetic code that determines whether you or I have blue eyes or brown eyes or brown hair or straight hair or curly hair. Nothing will ever change that. But in 1953, headlines in the newspaper stated secret of life had been discovered. Watson and Crooks, two scientists, had been able to unravel the DNA. That genetic code inside every cell. Did you know that if you pull that DNA out, it's two meters long? Let's have a look at the DNA. I think we've all seen illustrations of it. 23 chromosomes from our mother. My mother's chromosomes determine I have blue eyes. 23 chromosomes from our father. My father's chromosomes determine that I'm short. That at 61 I still have brown hair. We do it with each other. We do it with our brothers and our sisters and our children and our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents. It's always a fascinating subject to see which line comes through in each person. When you address that DNA and look what it's made up of, the crosswood bands are made up of amino acids. And amino acids, very simply, is a breakdown from the protein that we eat. It's like a veritable library, this DNA. And if you were to put all the information into alphabetical language, it would fill a thousand pages with a thousand uh, books and a thousand letters on each page. That's incredible, isn't it? What about the outward strands? They're made up of polysaccharides. Polysaccharides simply means many sugars. And basically polysaccharides is in just about everything that we eat. Our grains, our legumes, our nuts, our seeds, our fruits and vegetables, many sugars. And the substance that glues these amino acid strands to the outside bands of the polysaccharides is minerals. And the food that is the highest in minerals is vegetables. And the vegetable that is the highest in minerals is your dark green leafy vegetables. Hippocrates, called the father of medicine, he made a statement that's often quoted. He said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And he did not know about the DNA. He did not know that our very food makes up our DNA. And when I look at some supermarket trolleys, I think, how will their DNA ever remake them properly? Because the very nutrients required to make this DNA are deficient. Are deficient in your foods that are deficient, like all your fast food. But foods that are grown in the ground and eaten very quickly after they've been picked are very high in these basic things. We are constantly being remade and we're being remade according to the DNA. Did you know that our eye cells are remade every one to two days? That's why if people have eye surgery, it's usually day surgery, they heal very, very quickly. The next quickest are the cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. They're remade every three to five days. We've got a new skin every month. Where does the old skin go? That's why we vacuum the floor. That's why we change our clothes and wash them. That's why we change our sheets because our skin cells are constantly shedding. 
We have new bones about every three months. We have a new liver about every six weeks. So we're constantly being remade. I think it takes approximately two years. After two years, we have a new body. I used to say to people, you've got to look after this body. It's the only one you've got. If your car breaks down, if it starts to rust, it doesn't work anymore, you can get a new car, but you cannot get a new body. Well, I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind upon realizing that this body is constantly being remade and it's being remade according to the genetic code inside every cell of the body. You see, the two most common theories on why people are sick today is the gene theory and the germ theory. And at the moment we're pursuing this gene theory. What I'd like to do is I'd like to show you how a new gastrointestinal tract is cell is made. And when you understand how the new gastrointestinal tract cell is made, then you begin to understand why people aren't healing. Let's have a look. All the information is in the DNA on how to make a new gastrointestinal tract cell. Did you know that inside every cell in the body is all the information on how to make a totally new body? But in the gastrointestinal tract, we don't want the information on how to make a new liver cell or eye cell or bone cell. And so all the information that we need is literally switched on and all the other information is switched off. A photocopy is made, it's called RNA. RNA is a photocopy of all the information on how to make a new gastrointestinal tract cell. And it comes down to another part of the cell called ribosome. And ribosome is the little factory where the new cell is, is made. So RNA comes down into ribosome and the new cell starts to be made. Brick upon brick, the new cell is being made. What are the bricks? The bricks are amino acids. You probably have heard that amino acids is the building blocks of the body and that is true. What is the glue that glues the amino acids together? It is minerals. Minerals literally glues us together. Minerals are important. Brick upon brick and out pops a new gastrointestinal tract cell every three to five days. Our gastrointestinal tract lining looks like this. It's called villi. And down here in the valley, the new cell is made. And it takes three to five days for it to travel up and then it dies off and gets taken away. The gastrointestinal tract is a very interesting part of our body because it's actually not part of our body. What do I mean by that? It's an external structure. Well, my skin is an external structure and my watch is on my skin. My watch is not part of my skin. But if this watch were to happen to dissolve and then get absorbed through my skin, then my watch becomes part of my body. So in the gastrointestinal tract, it's an external structure. An interesting part about the gastrointestinal tract it is, it, is that it is eight meters long. It's one opening here, it's a hollow tube, and there's the other opening at the other end where the waste comes out. And the lining, specifically in the small intestine, it looks like this. So anything that goes into our gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny structures, which we'll be looking at this week. Then it gets absorbed through this, this lining into the blood because these villi are covered in little capillaries. That's our blood system. So that's what I mean when I say it's an external structure. Anything that goes into your gastrointestinal tract, not part of you or me, till it gets broken down to tiny structures, then gets absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you and me. It's a very important part of the gut. Is the lining. Hippocrates not only said, let food be your medicine, he said, all disease begins in the gut. Because if this gut's not working well, we're not getting the nutrients out of it and into the blood. I just showed you how a new gastrointestinal tract cell is made. 
Now I want to show you how an irritable bowel syndrome cell is made. Because by the way, if the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract are remade every three to five days, and we've just declared that this is so, and your anatomy and physiology book will declare it too, how come someone with irritable bowel is not healed in, let's be generous, two weeks? Is it a very reasonable question? Yes, it's a very reasonable question. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you how a new irritable bowel syndrome cell is made. RNA makes a photocopy of all the information, comes down to ribosome, the little workshop inside the cell where the new cell is made, and the new irritable bowel syndrome cell begins to be made brick upon brick. Oh dear, there is a piece of information missing. Brick upon brick. There's another piece of information missing. Brick upon brick. The person's short in a very important amino acid. Maybe it's tyrosine. Brick upon brick. Oh dear, they're short in magnesium, a vital mineral used for over 400 different body functions. It's looking very sad, isn't it? And out pops a new irritable bowel syndrome cell. This is the irritable bowel syndrome cell. Every three to five days. That simple illustration I have just touched on quite a few areas that give the reasons why people aren't healing. In that simple illustration of how a new gastrointestinal tract cell and a new irritable bowel syndrome cell is made. We touched on that. What I'd like to look at now is why. Why is there damage in the DNA? Especially when you realize that there are enzymes that are constantly threading up and down those strands and their role is to heal any glitches. But if the person's not eating the nutrients required to make those enzymes, we're even missing those. You see, what should be on the tip of our lips is always why. What did Julius Subner Miller always say? Why are these things so? He was quoting Newton's, Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion, that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. There is always a reason. Rudyard Kipling, very famous poet, he wrote a, he wrote a whole poem on this. I'll give you the first stanza. He said, I have six trusty serving men. They taught me all I know. Their names are what, why, when, where, how, and who. Do you take your six trusty serving men with you everywhere you go? Proverbs 26 verse 2, it states that the curse, causeless, shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. So we've got a big question mark here. Why? Why is there damage in the DNA? Today, research is showing that 92% of DNA damage is caused by mineral deficiency. How could Australians be mineral deficient? Australians are even eating cos lettuce today. I say that because 20 years ago, Aussies only ate the white heart of the iceberg lettuce. Jamie Oliver's done a lot for Australian cooking, hasn't he? <laughs> He's introduced a lot more greens. You see, the greens are the highest source of minerals of any of the vegetable kingdom. What we have to do is have a look at how those vegetables are grown. The soil is used over and over again. Every organic gardener knows that if he grows a crop in his soil, he cannot put another crop in that soil until he replaces all the minerals that the previous crop took out. So what's happening is plants are being grown over and over and over in the same soil. And they're not going too well. So superphosphate's put in the soil. Superphosphate kills the microorganisms in the soil and they are the ones that are responsible for pulling the minerals out of the soil and into the plant. So now the plant's deficient, even though it might look good. 
didn't taste any good. And all the bugs attack that plant. Notice the plant that the bugs attack, the wheat plant. So the gardener sprays the plant to kill the bugs. Then the, then the, then the plant's picked too early. Then it is stored too long. And then the last few minerals that may have been left in, say, the broccoli, when they're cooked in a saucepan and the person throws the water out, there go the last few minerals. How does that broccoli taste? If you had a blindfold on, you wouldn't even know it was broccoli. Have you ever eaten an apple off a tree? The taste is amazing. You know what you're tasting? Minerals. I was on a plane one day and I got an apple. I was quite excited, an apple on a plane, that's exciting. I took a bite, oh dear. If, if I hadn't known it was apple to look at, I wouldn't have known what I was eating. There was no flavour at all. This begins to explain why a lot of people, when they cook, they go to the MSG, they go to the stock cubes, because the food that they're eating does not have the flavour. You want high, high flavour food? Grow, grow your own and grow it in when well mineralized soil. Obviously, when people live on fast food that is totally mineral deficient, they're going to be mineral deficient. But we're finding people today who are even eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and are finding out that they're mineral deficient and it's because of the way that they're grown. So that is one of the reasons and as you can see by what the research is showing even 92 percent of dna damage is being caused by a mineral deficient mineral deficiency we've lost, lost the glue that's gluing us together chemicals it is estimated 30,000 new chemicals are introduced to mankind every year you have no say over the neighbor but you have total say over what is in your house Make a decision to become chemical free and go, go for organically grown fruits and vegetables as much as possible. Be cautious about what some of the things that are in the supermarket. We had a pest control man do our program. He said to me, there are things in that supermarket that I'm not allowed by law to use. <laughs> what would they be? What some of those oven cleaners, some of those bleachers, they're very toxic. As we go through this series, I will be showing you alternative ways to keep your house nice and clean. One form of chemicals not often seen as such is drug therapy. Drugs never cure disease, they just change the form and location of the disease and I'm referring to their side effects. Now if someone's been on on say antidepressants or cortisone drugs for many years, I do caution you must not stop them straight away. It's important if you are on any medication to find someone that who can work with you to show you alternatives and slowly come off them. It can be quite dangerous to stop them outright. Genetically modified foods. Genetically modified foods cause cancer because genetically modified foods are a result of the DNA of two species being spliced together. For instance, the, the DNA of an Atlantic salmon with the DNA of a tomato spliced together in the hope that a tomato will be created that will grow in the snow. But actually they don't usually result in that and there's this huge grey area. They do not know the full effect on human beings but what is known is the substances that are broken down in the body after eating genetically modified foods are not known in the body and have the ability to tamper and even damage our DNA. Electromagnetic field excess. We are electrical people. We have a spark of electricity in every cell. Our nervous system specifically is our electrical system. Electromagnetic field has the ability to tamper or interfere with your electromagnetic field, causing damage at the cellular level, even at the DNA level. In humans, they are 10 hertz, that's the electromagnetic field in humans. And that's, um, I think it's 10, uh, 10 revolutions per second. And with 
Huge power lines, you often get a 50 hertz and it's well known to cause damage at the cellular level. The farmer knows that he cannot let his cattle graze under those huge towers because stillborns will be a result, even um, deformities in the little calves. My children used to like going up to the huge towers. It was about a kilometre away from where we lived when they were little or when they were adolescent, and they would find everlasting daisies with five centers. They would find all this mutation in plant life underneath these big electrical towers. So if these towers have the ability to tamper with the DNA of plants and the DNA of animals, what about the DNA of humans? Absolutely. It was never allowed that houses could be built under those huge towers. But I see in housing states today, they're there and they are a contributing factor to damage of the DNA, even to contributing to, to disease in the human body. Be very careful of the room that you're sleeping in. We spend a third of our life in that room. Be careful of any electrical equipment in your room. Don't don't charge your mobile phone in your bedroom or your iPhone, iPad, iPod, computer, television. If you've got no choice, try and do it way over in the far corner. So always address where you're sleeping. Even where the head of your bed is, the wall. Make sure there's not the meter box the other side of the wall. Also, Stimulants. Stimulants have the ability to tamper with your DNA. And as I go through this, um, you will see what I mean by this. One is sugar. We have 400 diabetics being diagnosed every day in Australia at the moment. That's an epidemic. Sugar was not known on the planet until Sorry, diabetes was not known on the planet till sugar was well established. Hippocrates has no mention of diabetes in his, in his literature. What does sugar do? How does it cause diabetes? It causes a massive blood sugar level rise. And then the pancreas has to respond with a massive amount of insulin to get that blood sugar level down again. And then the person usually goes too low and they, so they go and get another little bit of sugar. And so what they're often doing, you'll find that their blood sugars are like this all day long. Crisis, 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 crisis. And eventually, the, the, the pancreas just says, I've had enough, and it doesn't produce insulin anymore. Diabetes mellitus simply means sweet urine. So when the pancreas isn't releasing insulin, then the insulin can't be stored in the cell. It stays in the blood and it spills out into the urine. In Australia today, we're looking at about fourth generation sugar abuse. Granted, many people don't realise they're abusing sugar. But it is a highly addictive drug, and I will be showing you that as we go through this series. Caffeine. Caffeine interferes with the neurotransmitters in the brain. And when the neurotransmitters in the brain are being interfered with daily, every day, every day, coffee, coke, chocolate, then that couple can give birth to a baby who has a tendency or a susceptibility to mental illness because of the disruption in neurotransmitters that constantly happening begins to affect the DNA. Also, tobacco, it's well researched, not only the effect of the unborn baby when the woman smokes, but also the defective DNA that a woman gives through. Not only a woman, but of course the father also can give a defective DNA through to the child. I saw a series of lectures in Melbourne a few years ago by Professor Walter Vyth, and he had photographs of lungs of children born to smoking parents. They had less alveoli, they had big holes in the honeycomb shape around the alveoli, all because of the smoking habits of the parents. Alcohol. Fetal alcohol syndrome is a condition that children can be born with to parents that drink two drinks a week. That's not very much, is it? 
There's a lot of information coming out more and more today on how damaging the alcohol is, not only to the cells of the human body, but how it affects the DNA. Anger. I have a book called Lessons from Water by a Japanese scientist, and he did a lot of research on water. Now, when you put water under a microscope, it has the same shapes that snow has. And he found that when he shouted at the water, had heavy rock music, um, anger, violence, and then he'd look at the water under the microscope and the perfect forms would all be marred. And then he would do another experiment where he had classical music and love, joy, peace, even those words. What he found amazing was if he put the word hate on the jar that the water was, it marred them. If he put the word love on the jar where the water was, it didn't mar them at all. Interesting. And we are much water. We are 75% water from the neck down, 85% water from the neck up. And so when a person is constantly subjected to anger and violence, it can damage the cells to the point of even damaging the DNA. Now, if you're feeling very discouraged right now at this list because you may tick every box, I've got some very good news. When you stop the things that are causing the problems, very quickly the body starts to respond and starts to heal itself. Fungus. If you look in nature, you will see that fungus can splice into the DNA of many plants. I look out the window and I see a Casarina pine tree and I see lichen growing on the bike, on the bark. How did it grow? How does it grow on the bark? It splices into the DNA of the plant and reproduces itself through the plant. David Attenborough has a show on ants and these ants are under the ground and this type of ant grows a mold or a fungus and the waste coming off it rolls into little balls and stores as its food. But they found that these ants did shift work. So each ant only tended the fungus for half an hour at a time. Because if the, ta if the ant tends the fungus for more than half an hour, the fungus can actually splice into the DNA of the ant. Whew. What I'd like to look at now is fungus. And by looking at fungus, we also address the germ theory. Fungus is a microorganism. Microorganisms, by their very word, are microscopic and they're living organisms. Microorganisms are everywhere. They're in the air. They're in on our skin, on our clothes, on everything we look at, there are microorganisms. They're everywhere. They're inside the human body. There are 10 times more microorganisms in our human body compared to cells. And the largest concentration is found in the gastrointestinal tract. There are 10 times more there than anywhere else in the body. And whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms have the ability to change roles. You see, if the environment changes, their role changes. And whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms now become the cleanup team. One microbiologist said to me, we call them the garbage collectors because that's their role on the planet. So that's what the microbiologists call bacteria. It's an opportunist organism, and the more filth you find, the more bacteria that you will find. As the environment changes, the bacteria changes roles, or the microorganisms change their roles. And they go from being the garbage collectors to being the exterminators, which is your yeast and your fungus. We find them very busy on the rainforest floor, don't we? They're exterminating the matter on the rainforest floor. As the environment changes, they change. 
they now become the undertakers. And undertakers are taking away dead things. Their name is mold. That's what it does. And it's not long after the mold stage that the matter is now brought back to dust. And what does the preacher say at the funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. He's referring to what's about to happen in that coffin. Did you know that they're talking about recycling graveyards? <laughs> because everything's just back to dust. I don't think they'll ever get away with it because of the memory that people have. But what I have drawn for you here is the cycle of life or the carbon cycle. A basic law of science states nothing's created and nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. It's the cycle of life. And when you think about it, if a kookaburra dies in the bush, what happens to it? It's brought back to dust. Now out there in the bush, dung beetles, worms, scavengers, blowflies, they all help with the process. There was a contemporary at the time of Louis Pasteur, who made the germ theory famous, and this contemporary, his name is Antoine Beauchamp. Antoine Beauchamp, six times professor this man, and he did not believe, as Louis Pasteur did, that germs cause disease. He said, no, 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 germs don't cause disease. They're the result of unhealthful conditions. And this cycle of life that I've just drawn you reveals that. One day Antoine Beauchamp got a dead cat. He wrapped it in an airtight container. He left it for four months. He came back after four months. He opened the container and it was full of dust, maybe a few burns. What brought cat back to dust? It's an airtight container. The microorganisms that were a living part, an active part of living, running cat, upon death of the organism, and basically that's the ultimate cell damage, these microorganisms took their suit of clothes off, so to speak, put their rubber gloves and apron on and became the garbage collectors. As the environment changed, they became the exterminators. As the environment changed, they changed down to the undertakers until eventually their task had been completed of bringing matter back to dust. These are the players in the cycle of life. These are the performers in the cycle of life. We need to know this and we need to work with this. Antoine Beauchamp got the dust from the dead cat. He put it under the microscope. It was alive with microorganisms. They'd finished their role of bringing matter back to dust. Now they're waiting in the dust ready for their next job. And isn't that why we use compost bins? I've always had three compost bins. One I'm adding to, one is sitting, and one I'm taking from. How do I know when it's ready to be taken from? Because I put my fork in and all I see is dirt. And I smell it and it smells like dirt. If it doesn't, it's got a bit of work to do. But I usually know when it's ready because that's when the pawpaw trees come up. That's when the pumpkin plants come up out of my compost bin. Then I shovel my compost into my garden. What am I putting into my garden? Microorganisms. Microorganisms that were part of that apple developing. Then, were the, then they were responsible for the apple ripening. And if the apple doesn't get eaten, they are now responsible for it rotting. Can you see that? They just change roles. As the environment changes, they change. And it rots down and it's in my compost bin and the microorganisms are still there. Remember the basic law of science? Nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. It just changes roles. And it changes roles according to the environment. Let me show you what's happening in the garden. 
let's say it's my celery plant. And these celery plants are remarkable. I've had them for years and they just keep reseeding and re keep coming up. And I put my compost into the soil. What am I putting into the soil? Microorganisms. These microorganisms, now they play another role. They brought the matter back to dust and now they are responsible for breaking up the heavy metals and the minerals in the soil to make them available for the roots of the plant. They're responsible for the breakdown. They are also responsible for the absorption of those minerals into the plant. But they play another role. They are also responsible for protection. Note those three important roles that the microorganisms play in the plant. Now the plant knows it needs them. And so 50% of the fuel that it makes, according to photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed those microorganisms. It's almost as if the plant says, please stay, I'll feed you well. Beautiful illustration of taking only to give again. Did you know that the law of service is written on every single plant in nature? They are responsible for the breakdown of the heavy metals and the minerals in the soil and making them available for the roots of the plants. There's the absorption. But they also protect the plant against harmful microbes. Let me take this one step further with you. But before I do, this explains why one organic tomato can have nine times the iron of a conventionally grown tomato. Did you know that? To look at them, they may look no different. You can certainly taste a difference because of the mineral content.